Introducing the new Poloniex trading system. Now with 30 times faster order matching, 10 times faster transactions, an enhanced user interface, and even more comprehensive features. Trade like a pro on Poloniex. For more information, visit poloniex.com now. Eager to make more informed decisions around crypto using data you can trust? Chainalysis demystifies cryptocurrency by providing industry-leading compliance, market intelligence, and investigation support for all crypto assets for organizations like Gemini, Crypto.com, and BlockFi. Maximize your potential with the leading blockchain data platform by visiting Chainalysis.com slash the scoop now. This episode is brought to you by IWC. IWC Schaffhausen is a Swiss luxury watch manufacturer based in Schaffhausen, Switzerland. Known for its unique engineering approach to watchmaking, IWC combines the best of human craftsmanship and creativity with cutting edge technology and processes. Discover the full collection at IWC.com or download the IWC app to experience a virtual try on now. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and not necessarily those of the blocks. Podcast guests may have taken positions in the assets or other matters discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. For full terms, visit theblockcrypto.com slash terms dash service. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Tim Copeland, filling in for Frank Chaparro for part one of a three-part special series on the Ethereum Merge. Joining us today on The Scoop Ethereum Merge Edition is my guest, Lex Soklin, head economist at Consensus. This is Lex's second appearance in The Scoop since his first appearance with The Scoop's Frank Chaparro back in 2020, and we're glad to have him again with us to clear up a lot of the questions surrounding the merge, what the Bellatrix upgrade means for the chain's ecosystem, and what this represents for the future of Ethereum and for market participants. Lex, thanks so much for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I can't believe it's been uh, two years. The time goes very quickly. I mean, it's been longer since the merge was first ever discussed, and it's kind of come into fruition. And um, on that point, can you give us some background on the merge as it's been discussed over the past six or seven years, and why the move from proof of work to proof of stake is such a significant moment in Ethereum's history. Absolutely. That does take us to the beginning of cryptocurrency more generally. And the mechanisms that are used to secure different chains. You know, chains are useful in large part because of the data they hold. And that data is only accurate because of the consensus mechanisms that are used to you know, to arrive at particular blocks and then at the mechanisms used to secure those blocks. And so with a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, the mechanism of proof of work, is sort of the, the initial approach to securing blockchains. And that's, of course, we're all familiar with mining and using your GPU and graphics card in order to, to solve puzzles and thereby use electricity and get rewards from different blocks probabilistically. And a similar mechanism is used in Ethereum. You know, the proof of work requires hardware, it requires electric power, it requires kind of brute force real world calories to be converted into the chance to get a reward. And the fantastic thing about proof of work is that it actually does secure a blockchain it does the thing it, it, it is intended for, and it creates this amazing quality of digital scarcity for digital goods. You know, Bitcoin works, Ethereum very obviously works, and on top of having digital goods, it also has computation. So not, not only can you have stuff, but you can build software around it and agree to the outcomes of, you know, whatever that software executes towards. The downside to proof of work is that calories in the real world, energy is expensive. And you know, not only is it expensive, it also has lots of secondary effects on the environment, on markets, and so on. So, you know, when you have a supply shock, you know, with the war in Ukraine and Russia and the conflict there, or when you have 
all sorts of other manipulations of the price of electricity, that starts to impact markets more broadly. It starts to impact the economics of miners and spills over into blockchains as well. Now, there's lots of other effects, but that's kind of the basic point around electricity. We also want the world to be greener and we, we want the world to be more anti-fragile and the world, both the physical world as well as the digital systems that we build. We want to aspire to digital systems that are clean, that are sustainable, and that are anti-fragile, that are decentralized in ways that give them kind of resistance to being censored or resistance to being shut down. So if you look at the pressures in China, for example, around mining, those are the types of issues that we want to protect our blockchain systems from. And so if we look at the history of Ethereum, the idea that the network would move from proof of work, i.e. electricity, calories, towards proof of stake is quite an old one and really focuses on how can we replace the mining mechanism with a different mechanism that doesn't require the same electric consumption and energy use. And so proof of stake at its core is the idea that you would use capital, that you would use financial positions in order to secure the network, and that financial positions would be slashed or punished for bad actors and for good actors who are contributing to the security of the chain, they would be rewarded with a particular yield. And so the, the mechanism of proof of stake you know, has been developed for now years and years until now, where it is coming to fruition with kind of this network switch called the merge. There's lots of other stuff underneath there as well. The proof of stake chain has been now running for, for many months. I think something like 11% of Ethereum's already being used to validate the beacon chain and, and is locked into it. So this thing has been in production and the kind of the path ahead of us is to switch over to the proof of stake system from the proof of work system. And therefore that's what we're looking at with the merge. Awesome. So you said it's a different kind of type of securing the network. Are there any trade-offs with securing the network via staking as opposed to mining? I think it's a it's a very different approach just in terms of the user experience. With a proof of work approach, you know, there is a a set of barriers that are kind of um, minimum cost barriers that are technical barriers and that are skill friction that would prevent somebody from becoming a miner. You have to know how to run particular specialized software. You also are likely buying miner hardware because you want to be efficient about actually performing the, the mining calculations. And you know may, maybe you're running a rig in your home. Maybe you're part of some sort of mining pool where lots of people collect together and provide their capital to a third party. Uh, but in all cases, I mean, there's the, the actual process of setting up a miner is, is very non-trivial, it's difficult. And then the mechanism by which the rewards come is, you know, it's quite different. You, you don't necessarily think of it as, you know, a percent yield on the network. You think of it as I'm running this hardware at some particular cost, and then with some probability, I'm going to be rewarded for a particular block. And so it's it's a little bit of a different equation. Whereas with proof of stake, and there's gonna be different flows for this and we can talk about that, but with proof of stake, you've got your capital in Web3, right? On chain, you have some ETH position in your MetaMask wallet or in, in some other wallet. And what you need to do is to stake that ETH and in return, you get a yield on those assets. And the yield is the same for anybody that stakes. So whether or not you are a gigantic institutional position that's trying to create a fixed income-like return profile, or whether you are somebody who you know, has 32 ETH and that's kind of your savings account, savings-like account, and you're trying to earn 5%, both of you are subject to the same economics because the economics are sort of fractional and you're receiving the, the same returns. Now, there's, there's some barriers for people who might not have 
enough capital to stake, but at the same time, there are derivatives, there, there are tokens, you know, whether it's through Lido or whether there's the new Coinbase staking initiative or Rocket Pool or lots of others where it's possible to own a fractional share of a staked ETH position and be exposed to it that way as well. So you're kind of going from, you know, in my mind, it's the difference between uh, like a coal powered train where you've got to mechanically put the energy into the furnace and then going into a digital world where with a couple of clicks, you can be exposed to the validator economics. Okay. And you've highlighted the um, environmental impact on this. How does the merge change the ESG story for Ethereum, for NFTs, and kind of crypto more broadly? I think the ESG story is one of the one of the more frustrating narratives that has floated around crypto since the beginning. And I think that for people who enjoy skepticism, and there's lots of people who want to see kind of crypto fail for a variety of reasons, there are narratives that continue to come up every year over and over again, whether it is the sort of money laundering narratives around criminals. And so, you know, so like evidence of that is the tornado cash sanctions. You can trace that all the way back to Mt. Gox or whether it is kind of this environmental angle that says that the mining of cryptocurrency and the maintenance of the networks is kind of bad for the environment. But it's not even just that. It's that it's bad for the environment in a way that kind of contradicts the utopian journey, right? So a lot of how people align with Web3 and crypto is through idealistic storytelling about what the world could be. And it's really important to be open-minded and have kind of hope for what new platforms can create. Hope that the centralization of Facebook and Google can be overcome that the core banking systems and the portfolio management systems and the anti-angel investing laws, right? Like the crowdfunding issues, that all of that can be overcome in favor of the consumer by Web3 and that you can pass the torch of self-sovereignty to the individual and that you can give people the decision to participate in their future and that this future is is digital in a way that's that's fundamentally different from the legal and economic systems that we have in place. And I think a lot of people believe in this narrative and many parts of it are true. And I think we're also seeing this with NFT adoption by large brands and engagement around Web3 art and music and so on. And so the story of crypto having a negative impact on, on the earth, the story of this energy consumption and negative ESG kind of positioning is really fundamental to undermining the much more utopian positioning and the hope of what the space is trying to accomplish. And like, don't take me wrong, there's nobody in crypto who's trying to have a bad outcome in the world. Like people are here because they want to change things for the better. And so I think whether or not the actual mathematics of how people negatively paint Bitcoin or ETH around ESG, whether or not those mathematics are true and whether or not you know the existing banking system takes up more energy by an order of magnitude than anything crypto related, I think that's beside the point. The thing for me that's important is going to be putting the ESG sort of concern or pushback behind us. You know, it, it is fantastic that the merge is going to result in something like 99.95% reduction in energy use. Like, that's fantastic. But even more important is just to remove this barrier in, in the narrative so that when people decide to make art, when they make collectible NFTs, when they make music, when they set up royalties, when they build video game worlds or metaverse worlds, that it's understood that these are systems for good, that they don't have a negative outsized impact on the environment, that they're clean systems, and that they are congruent with the type of future that Web3 wants to build. And I think that's going to be one of the key you know, outcomes that the artists that maybe are using things like 
Tezos or you know custom chains, whether it's Flow or Immutable or whatever, that they start to understand that ETH is the clean option as well, and that it has the biggest community of any in Web3 and it's available to them. Okay, so do you think this will bring a lot of brands and creators back to Ethereum? Because we saw with a lot of rival chains, particularly when it comes to NFTs, they had this big argument, what well, are environmentally friendly? Uh, and I think that helped attract a lot of attention to their chains. But after the merge, they won't have that selling point in the same way. So do you think it will bring a lot of that activity back to Ethereum? Or do you think it will remain on those chains? I think that most of what is going to happen is ahead. You know, so in all cases, whether or not kind of the priors transition over to to the Ethereum chain is kind of a, a nice to have. What really matters is for the next hundred million people, for the next billion people, and so on, where are they going to be transacting? What systems are they going to be using? And when we look at developers, you know, right now I think Infura's got something like half a million developers building out largely on, on Ethereum and a number of other layer two chains in the EVM world connected to Ethereum. And so the question is, where are developers going to be building? What is the most secure environment for them? What's the environment that allows them the most scale? And similar for artists, you know, artists of all kind, including metaverse game designers, environment designers, and so on, as well as just pure NFT communities. The question is, where will they choose to build their next product? And I think removing the objection around ESG is is very meaningful because it does change kind of culturally some of the value proposition of Ethereum to those communities who take really seriously these issues around electricity consumption and impact. Again, whether or not kind of the math of that makes sense. So I do think that it'll be easier for them to choose Ethereum going forward. I think the other question is around performance and scalability and gas, gas cost, right? So if Ethereum is expensive to use and if it doesn't process as many transactions as a layer two or some other kind of less decentralized chain, is it performant for these other use cases? And I think the answer to that also comes in over time. And from our perspective, a consensus, I think the multi-chain world or the world where Ethereum is a kind of a global security settlement layer that anchors the layer twos and anchors the, the core digital value in terms of you know, digital asset value or trading or things of that nature, Ethereum remains at the core, right? So when you think of market venues, market venues succeed when they see lots of capital markets participants, liquidity, trading, when they see the most assets and so on. So in many ways, Ethereum continues to do that. And then for more bespoke applications, applications that require maybe very high throughput or that require maybe very particular response times or things like that, there's tons of solutions that are attached to Ethereum that process along the same logic, that compute software in the same way that are available and of course will continue to be available throughout the merge. And I think that points maybe to an issue of like, what is the main Ethereum chain, right? Is it the proof of work chain or the proof of stake chain? And I think that the weight, the heft of the ecosystem of all the protocols, of all of the DAOs, like where they continue to function is gonna continue making the proof of stake chain being the the major one that that sees all of the you know, development and commitment. Yeah. So here you're, you're referencing to the potential fork by miners that might happen around the time of the merge. Do you see that fork having any value? It's an interesting question. It's a really, it's a really novel question. The comparison we've got is probably from the Bitcoin forks, probably three, four years ago now, right? Bitcoin Cash and the variety of others. In the beginning days, those forks did hold value, maybe 10%, 15% 
in terms of market cap of the overall chains. I mean, if you look at Ethereum Classic, for example, that held something like 15% of the market cap and then dissipated as it had less and less utility, meaning fewer and fewer applications were choosing Ethereum Classic over Ethereum itself. And so I think of the forks as a kind of dividend, like a distribution of value from a particular you know, project at a particular point of time. I have trouble imagining an ecosystem, the size of the ecosystem on Ethereum would be maintained in multiple places at the same time. And I just, I just don't see those incentives working. You know, at the same time, I can see from the perspective of the miners who had invested in hardware and set up business operations to mine the chain and secure the chain, you know, I can see why they would want to keep the party going as it is. But I think the positive impact of a transition from proof of stake in terms of the energy consumption being so massively reduced, as well as in terms of laying the groundwork for for sharding, for a multi-chain world, as well as for more beneficial unit economics around yields, just far outweigh the sunk cost of that hardware. Introducing the new Poloniex trading system with 30 times faster order matching, 10 times faster transactions, an enhanced user interface, and even more comprehensive features. Trade Bitcoin, Ethereum, and over 30 other perpetual swap contracts with up to 100x leverage on Poloniex futures and earn staking rewards on a variety of tokens. Trade like a pro on Poloniex. For more information, visit poloniex.com now. Are you eager to make more informed decisions around crypto using data you can trust? Chainalysis is here to help. Chainalysis demystifies cryptocurrency by providing industry-leading compliance, market intelligence, and investigation support for all crypto assets for organizations like Gemini, Crypto.com, and BlockFi. Gain unparalleled visibility and maximize your potential with the leading blockchain data platform by visiting chainalysis.com slash the scoop now. This episode is brought to you by IWC. IWC Schaffhausen is known for continually innovating within the world of Swiss watchmaking. A pioneer in the use of titanium and ceramics, IWC today specializes in highly engineered watch cases manufactured from advanced materials such as colored ceramics, ceritanium, and titanium aluminide. This year's collection includes colored ceramic pieces in Lake Tahoe white and woodland green. Discover the new collection at IWC.com or download the IWC app to experience a virtual try-on now. Ali, you, you mentioned how Ethereum applications want to take on social media giants and kind of established platforms. And you also discussed the concept of being anti-fragile. But over the last like month or so, we've had the sanctions against Tornado Cash. We've seen DeFi projects banning addresses that received funds from Tornado Cash and things like that. And we've seen arguably a lot of kind of centralization with a lot of these protocols. And like even in Fura itself, adheres to sanctions and blocks addresses. Do you think that Ethereum is anti-fragile? That's a fantastic question. In many ways, it's an impossible question, which makes it fantastic in the first place. There is a bunch of ways to, to think about it, one of which is kind of the dialectic or the pendulum, like the crypto pendulum, right? So it swings in different directions at different times. and People might want to call it cycles if you're obsessed about prices, but it's more than that. It's kind of these cultural cycles, right? So you've got Bitcoin as this liberating force throwing a brick through the window of the global macroeconomic system, right? Like it's going to it's going to replace all money. What's the market for all money in the world? And then you have the pushback to that from large banks saying, well, 
the payments bid doesn't work because it's not fast enough and it can't absorb enough liquidity and all these things. And so we're just going to take the blockchain underneath the Bitcoin stuff and we're going to build our own enterprise blockchains and they're going to be the actual you know currencies that survive, right? So the banks try to co-opt the decentralized technology into something that is consistent with what they already do. And so you've got a bunch of enterprise blockchain projects in like 2014, 2015, 2016. And those payments networks or those equities exchanges, they haven't gotten particularly far, right? So if you look at the Australian Stock Exchange, which was supposed to be completely rebuilt using digital asset systems, it's still pretty stuck. And so then you have the rise of Ethereum with ICOs and the ability for anybody to launch their own token and build their own kind of on-chain protocol and fundraise. And so you had a year and a half of initial coin offerings being really, really popular and everybody rushing into that. And of course, when that wave crashed out, it was the opposite reaction. And so during that bear market, the idea of security tokens and you know digital bonds and digital private equity, and again, the banks and the governments creating financial instruments on, on crypto networks came as the reaction. But while you had the banks doing that, the reaction on the other side was the rise of DeFi and building functional, performant financial software embedded into Ethereum that is able to replicate a lot of what the financial industry is set up to do. You know, and while DeFi get, is getting turned on, the hedge fund and private equity and alternatives industry is looking at the asset class and starting to build software like Fireblocks, institutional software to connect into DeFi and into the crypto asset class, you know, and vice versa. And you see this with NFTs like CryptoPunks, and then you see that in the reaction of brands trying to co-opt the trend and the fashion. And so it goes back and forth. You know, right now we're in a place where central bank digital currency and regulation and kind of censorship are a reaction to things like Terra, things like Celsius and 3AC and Voyager. And frankly, it's a reasonable reaction and it's the direct consequence of in many ways failing consumer trust and delivering bad outcomes. But I think these, these cultural cycles continue, they go back and forth. And so while right now may feel like elements or various elements of the ecosystem are you know, being censored or being put in a place that, that can be controlled, in reality, I just think this is what the cycle of innovation looks like, where you go too far, things get clipped, it retracts, and then you have another push, and then it just kind of continues on and on like that. From the perspective of, is Ethereum like sufficiently decentralized? Is it censorship resistant? Will it be able to survive regardless of the different types of kind of sovereign actions to contain it or the various regulations that can be placed against particular protocols. As far as I can tell, I think the evidence is that the answer is yes. Like for sure, the sanctions on Tornado Cash are really rough and kind of brute force and are setting up a strange precedent that that precedent may or may not stand. Like it, just because there's been some particular action doesn't mean that action won't be reversed. Doesn't mean that action won't be challenged in court, right? Because there are lots of damages that may have been inadvertently created out of those sanctions. But even with those sanctions, it's not like the system's not performing. Like we've got something like 200 million addresses on ETH. There continues to be you know millions of transactions per day in Web3, if you look at the various EVM chains. So, you know, from my perspective, while there continue to be growing pains, those are more kind of constraints around which the, the water flows, but they're not, they're in no way stopping the actual force of the water. And then coming back to the merge, how have you and Consensus been preparing kind of the Ethereum infrastructure for it? You know, so Consensus does a number of different things that are key to the ecosystem. The way I would describe it, and historically, 
Consensus was a venture studio which seeded a number of projects in our in our ecosystem. And by historically, I mean you know, 2017, 2018 timeline. It's been a while since we have not been focused on that. So today, Consensus is a company that primarily does two things. Number one, helps users access Web3 and use it. And then number two, it helps developers build applications on Web3 and reach users. So the more users we're able to bring into Web3, the better that is for developers because their stuff will end up getting used and played with. And then alternately, the more developer infrastructure and protocol infrastructure that we give to people who are builders and creators, then there is more stuff in the operating system or in the kind of market of Web3. And that means that consumers are interested in it because they get value out of interacting with you know, NFTs, DAOs, DeFi, whatever it is. So you know, for us, there are a number of levers that are important. Number one is we actually contribute to protocol development. We contribute to making sure that Ethereum can successfully execute the merge and that there are you know, clients that work, that there is staking infrastructure that works, that all of it is integrated into the software that our clients use, right? So I've already mentioned Infura that that helps developers connect into Web3 and run software on Ethereum, as well as on a number of other protocols, whether it's you know Polygon or Arbitrum or otherwise. And so we need to make sure that the, the platforms that we provide to people are performant, that they can read, they can write, and so on. On top of actually helping you know, the protocol team contribute code to Ethereum as a whole. And then on the wallet side, we have to make sure that user experience continues to be consistent. You know, so if you look at something like EIP-1559, when the gas mechanics changed, there was a bunch of stuff that happened, you know, inside of MetaMask to make it understandable to people what happens with the gas fee. You know, what of that is burnt? What of that is sent to, in the future, it'll be validators. You know, so from a user experience perspective, there can be changes that affect the mechanisms of the protocol itself. And, and you have to figure out how somebody who isn't all that interested in the inner workings of crypto, you know, how do they interact with that using their wallet? You know, so I think those two audiences are the core audiences for us. Again, in addition to more more generally supporting protocol development and contributing to it as well. Yeah, and how is Consensus advising institutions and crypto companies on the effects of the merge over the long and the short term? It's a tricky question because there are many ways you can have relationships with companies, right? With enterprises and with institutions. And the relationship with them changes depending on what cultural moment you're in. So I've described before the moment where companies wanted to have their own blockchains or they wanted to have their own digital asset exchanges or things like that. That world has transformed into a world where institutions want to have exposure to the asset class. So it's not about, you know, how do I plug in a blockchain to generate cost reduction in you know, some giant capital market system or some core banking system. Instead, it's, you know, I'm a hedge fund, I'm a private equity firm, I'm a large asset manager. How do I create revenue by giving my clients access to this asset class in the context of the, the much broader kind of macroeconomic activity, right? So it's a pretty rough macroeconomic environment. We've got rates going up, we have inflation continuing to go up people's ability to spend and consume is way down, you know, and so there's there's definitely a sensation of fear out there. And I think our focus is, is just on being able to paint the picture for people on what the ETH asset looks like, you know, after the merge. And there are a couple of important pieces within that. You know, so the economics of the supply of the token are changing. 
Whereas before you might have gotten something like you know four percent of a, of a yield on your Ethereum position if you do have a lot of mining infrastructure. After the merge, anybody can access yield. You don't have to be a miner. The yield can be anywhere from like five percent to over ten percent, depending on you know how many people are staking, what the transaction fees look like, whether MEV. So the the equivalent of high frequency trading value, whether that accrues to validators and how it's plugged in. And so painting the picture of the asset class, making sure that people understand that it's going to be an ESG positive asset class, like all of those elements are really important for us. And we've been developing an offering called MetaMask Institutional, which lets asset managers, large crypto investors, potentially DAOs, have more control in terms of the workflow of how people access the Ethereum ecosystem. So you have the full access of MetaMask, absolutely anything and everything on Web3 that you want to engage with. But then you, from an institutional perspective, you might have additional workflows that you just can't get around putting into place for people inside your organization. And so you know, for the clients that we have using MetaMask Institutional, they're looking at the merge and they're trying to understand, like, how does this plug into our investment motion? How do we get exposure? What's reasonable? And I think being able to point to the expected deflationary economics, meaning you've got return from the yield, you have potentially more burning of token supply relative to issuance, which is going to be cut down a lot, you know, just getting people to understand those dynamics is really important. Yeah. Yeah. You said yield, you see it between kind of five, 10%. I think currently it's looking more like three to 4%. Do you think there's going to be a big difference for miners, you know, now becoming validators that they're going to get less yield? It depends. It depends because return always comes with risk. And so if you're getting higher return, you have to ask about the source of that return. Why are you getting higher return? You know, And I think the ranges that I've got are a function of, if there's less capital securing the network, then you get a higher return. And that's more risky for the network. And so you attract more capital to secure the network further, which is going to lower the yield because that the particular returns going to more people, right? And so if the network is more secure, then the risk of the network goes down. And therefore, you know, the interest rate that you're getting is meant to reflect sort of on a risk adjusted basis, a similar quality, a similar exposure, right? So you, you are reducing your risk because the network is more secure, uh, but you're getting less in, in real yield. I think the other the other bit is around you know this MEV whether MEV is going to be captured and distributed to validators or whether the current model where you know most mostly it's private actors being able to clip it off for themselves as if they were a high frequency trading shop persists and I think those are you know those are still unknown but even in a world of a three to five percent interest rate. You know, that's, that's a different world where we are now because it sets something like a benchmark for the rest of the financial engineering that you see on chain. You know, so if you have lots of DeFi protocols that are doing margin lending or that are doing liquidity provision, right, if you're getting paid in fees for trading and so on, if there is an embedded 5% reward on ETH, Everyone is going to compare the rewards from a DeFi protocol relative to the rewards from the core computational protocol. So I think that's going to put some really interesting dynamics for for how people invest, especially for how crypto funds and institutions that are focused specifically on Web3, what they allocate to and how they think of risk return more generally. As for inflation, it's going to decrease from around 4% to about 0.5%. And then if you include burning at the moment, that's looking at a kind of net 0.1% inflation, obviously that could go deflationary if there's high activity. How does this change kind of Ethereum's economics? Yeah, I think what you describe is, is exactly on point. Like it's exactly the issue, right? Where 
the basic point is if you have inflation, whether it's 5% or 10% or whatever it is, the inflation for people who are not experiencing the 5 or 10% yield, they're going to be losing purchasing power in terms of that 5 or 10%. Now, if you layer on lots of capital gains and capital losses on top, most people just aren't going to know, right? So if you're holding Ethereum, if you're holding ETH and it goes up 200% and then falls 80% and then it goes up another 300%, you might not feel the 5 to 10% inflation that you're losing from, which is being distributed as a cost to secure the network. Generally speaking, we don't really want to be in a world where things YOLO up 10 times and then collapse 80% you know, every couple of years. You want to be in a world where you have a large, performant, global computational settlement layer that runs essentially the world's decentralized software on it and connects to all these different protocols. And so if you get rid of the price volatility and, you know, that's a big if, then people start to really understand and see how important inflation and deflation really is. And so by removing the additional printing of the token to reward miners, you're in essence giving back more to the users, right? So if you're paying out less to validators and less is still not, not little, it is still kind of more on a percent basis than you would get in a bank, and then the rest is burned, something like 50% or 80% of the tokens you know, are burned through gas consumption, then you're giving that value back to the users of the protocol, which is the right place to put the value, right? Because end of the day, these things, their value is not fixed. So it's not like there is, you know, a $500 billion fair value for Ethereum and you change the token number and that's what makes it go up and down. It's the usage of the protocol and the building on it and the, the growth in users and the growth in continued activity that actually makes it valuable. So that rewards users for their time and for their investment. Awesome. Once again, we have been joined today by our guest, Lex Soklin, head economist at Consensus. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for listening. I'm Tim Copeland, editor at The Block. Stay tuned for the Scoop Merge Edition Part 2. Looking for more great insights from The Block? Check out The Block Research, the premier platform for research content on crypto markets and the digital asset industry. The Block Research membership includes cutting edge reports, webinars, company maps, and more available via our dedicated research portal. Visit theblockresearch.com to find out how to join today or contact a member of our sales team at sales at theblockcrypto.com and let them know that Frank sent you.